My lords, ladies, knights, hedge knights, maesters, sell swords, small folk, wildlings, and terrifying blue-eyed ice zombies, welcome to the Sydney, to the Sydney. For tonight, this venue is being renamed the Sydney Wester Opera House. A little bit awkward. Screw it. Uh, for tonight's Game of Thrones event, presented by the Opera House and, of course, Supernova. Uh, my name is Dom Knight. I'm your MC for this evening, which is very cool. And I'd like to start by acknowledging and paying my respects to the traditional owners of this land, the Gadigal people of the Aora Nation, their elders past and present. I also want to acknowledge that, yes, I am doing Movember, uh, not auditioning for Super Mario the porno, but if you know anyone... <laughs> Uh, put in a good word. It's a great honour for me to have been asked to host this event in Westerosi terms. It feels like I've been named Hand of the King. I'm hoping I'll last till the end of the night without getting murdered. <laughs> um, and of course, we Australians have embraced the world of ice and fire more than anyone, at least judging by the stats on illegal downloads. <laughs> and so I want to pay tribute to all of you in the room tonight. You are the first Australians ever to pay for Game of Thrones. Give yourselves a round of applause. Well done. This series is so huge here. Even Julia Gillard used to watch Game of Thrones when she got home from a day in Parliament. I think compared to the intrigue and bloodshed of politics, she found it calm and relaxing to watch Game of Thrones. And I remember on the day Kevin Rudd came back to office, and got his revenge. One of the top trending hashtags on Twitter was Rudd Wedding. <laughs> it was. And I'd like to think that makes Bill Short and Walter Frey. I'm not sure. <laughs> now look, we're about to get things underway. I just want to explain what's going to happen tonight. We're going to welcome in a moment the fabulous Lena Headey and Michelle Fairley to the stage for a chat. <laughs> and talk all things television. After about half an hour, we will be joined by George R.R. R. Martin himself and have a chat about the novels, the TV series and the whole world that he's created. Uh, after that, there will be some questions from the audience. There are four microphone points, two down here, um, a few further up. And those are also the emergency exits, by the way. So, um, so start thinking of, of questions now. But I, I will say that Westeros is a brutal place if your question goes on too long, that's definitely going to happen. Um, after we finish up, at about half past nine, there will be a signing in the southern foyer. You will only be able to get one item signed, only books and official merchandise items. No body parts. This isn't one of Littlefinger's brothels. The first thing I want to do, uh, final thing, just before we invite them onto the stage, is assess the level of knowledge in the room to try and avoid spoilers, of course. Uh, there's a wonderful World of Ice and Fire app you can get. You can set which book you've read up to so that the biographies don't contain surprises. It's very thoughtful. Now, I've read all the books and I've watched all the TV show episodes, but next to some of your knowledge, I know that my understanding of the books is Tyrion size. So let's do a quick test. The other day I was asking on Facebook for just a few ideas from friends, and one of my friends said, well, there's honey. There's honey in all the food in the books. Because where are the bees in Westeros? Where are the bees? Another friend, uh, Pat, said... Duh, uh, they're in the village of Honeytree in the Riverlands, which was held by Lord Blackwood, but get transferred to Lord Bracken because of, he backed the wrong side. If you knew that, clap now. Yeah, a few people here, a few people here. Well done, that is wiki-level knowledge. Um, if, like me, you've read all the books and could therefore ruin things for people who've only watched the TV series, clap now. Ah, there we go. Now, please... Be considerate of the slow pokes and uh, don't mention, uh, for instance, that later in the, in the books, Robert Brathian's head gets attached to Lady's body and reanimated into a zombie direwolf that kills Cersei. Don't, do not mention that. Um, it doesn't, or does it? Um, if you've only read, uh, if you, sorry, if you've only seen the TV series, please clap now. Pretty good. My advice to all of you, after this is over, go home and watch uh, the Axis of Awesome's song, Rage of Thrones. You'll know how the rest of us feel uh, if we've read the books. If you've only seen a bit of the first series and are pretty sure that that nice Ned Stark fellow is going to prevail against those nasty Lannisters, 
Clap now. A couple of people, have we got some surprises for you? And finally, if you've no idea what these names are that I've been throwing at you, and you just thought it'd be fun to come to whatever this is, clap now. What the hell are you doing here? These tickets were not cheap. All right, we'll try and avoid spoilers post-season um, three, but as any Game of Thrones fan knows, life is not fair. Um, <laughs> please turn off your mobiles. Do not film or record the event. If you do, I will signal to the attendants the reins of Castamere will be played on the PA <laughs> and a volley of crossbow arrows will be unleashed at your seat. Please note that I am wearing chainmail. <laughs> so let's get into it. Please welcome two of the stars of Game of Thrones, Lena Headey and Michelle Fairley. I think they like you guys. Just, I'm getting the sense. Uh, let me start with you, Lena. What did you think when you first read the pilot script for Game of Thrones? Uh, I thought, this is fucking nuts. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm in. <laughs> did you always think, uh, were you always thinking of, of Cersei, or were you not sure? Did you try for a few different roles? I tried for Tyrion, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> didn't work out. Uh, no, I... I, I was actually reading for Catelyn and Cersei. And, they just uh, thought you were evil, did they? Was it the I think, <laughs> yes, that's what happened. <laughs> they were how, like, how about horrible. you, Michelle? How did you uh, sort of get the pilot? And did you, did you I, I didn't do another? the pilot. You didn't do the pilot? No. Um, I came in after the pilot. Yeah. Probably same. should have watched the DVD commentary, shouldn't I? Yeah. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. So should I, actually. And so you, you, you came in. What did you first think when you saw the script? I loved it, and I knew that um, the characters, the women characters, were amazing. So that's why I wanted to get my claws into it. And um, also, it was under the umbrella of HBO, and anything that is made by them is superlative and well worth being involved in. Superlative, but with nudity and, and violence. But, but, but none of mine. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, as, as we know, they're, they're making some of the best TV in the world today. It, it, it's a Absolutely. great thing. So there is a pilot out there with a different Catelyn uh, Tully Stark. Yeah, absolutely. Right, well, we'll just bury that forever. Um, <laughs> but you, you mentioned the amazing parts for women here. And fantasy is not generally known as a genre that has complex, uh, you know, detailed characters. I remember I was reading that Peter Jackson actually had to create... Um, a role for Galadriel in, in the Hobbit movies, just so there was one woman for like five minutes in each of the movies. Um, have, you, have you seen much fantasy before? Have you been in fantasy before? Me? Only, only on a weekend. <laughs> <laughs> Both your characters play the Game of Thrones, Michelle, and, and your character gets more and more into it as the series progresses. And how did you find Catelyn change from the start of the series as, as, as she went on? Um, oh, gosh. Um, I think she changes substantially in terms of it's a role that she's still learning. You know, it's a, she never thought she'd have to go that path, so off she goes and she keeps going. And then she sees her son becoming king of the north and... Uh, but her whole modus operandus, basically, is to get her family back together. And um, I think... <laughs> Haha. She's a bitch. Um, so... Uh, what's left of it. And... Um, so, yeah, so she changes substantially. <laughs> I'm not doing very well, am I? Uh, you all look amazing, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> so many of you. <laughs> Sorry, what was the question? <laughs> and and Lena, with, with Cersei, I mean, do you see her as, as villain or victim in all this? Because there's, you could argue it either way, really. Uh, I, I think, you know... Villain. <laughs> 
I think there's kind of both elements there. You know, what I, mean? I mean, from her own family, the pressure, you know, the way she was brought up, the relationship with her dad, it's fucked up. Do you know what I mean? And she's <laughs> in the midst of this kind of male-dominated kingdom. And, uh, and as they all do, the women, they kind of fight their own fight. And uh, I think they do it pretty bloody well. I, I, you know, I think she's kind of a bit of everything. There's a beautiful scene where uh, Cersei reflects on... Has sex with her brother. <laughs> yeah, well, that... <laughs> <laughs> that is a beautiful scene. <laughs> I'm not going to judge. Hey, it's romantic. that's just the way it was. Targaryens did it for generations. It's all good. Oh. Want to get it while you can. And Keep it in the family. <laughs> huh? He's a good-looking man, too. Yes. I, can, I completely see your point. But um, where, <laughs> where you... Um, your, your character just reflects on, you started out as twins, you did everything together, but then things start, <laughs> that wasn't even intended. Things, things started to change and the different expectations kicked in. Yeah. And Cersei had one path, Jamie had another. Well, this season that we just shot, season four, God, I can't believe that, uh, was a very different uh, relationship for the two of them. Uh, what I love about this is it, it endlessly... Uh, evolves and there's constant change and so um, I think it was something unforeseen for her what happens uh, this season which you haven't seen so I'm going to stop talking <laughs> but ha have you b both read ahead do you know um, what happens later in the story going forward yes mm. <laughs> <laughs> and, and is that something you did from the, from the beginning or was it a, a thing where you you made the first series, and then only then did you discover what lay ahead. Uh, it's quite hard, because a lot of the other actors have read it, so they start talking about... I've read all the books they started, and they just kept going like a massive feast. And um, as I read, I read her series. Um, so you don't want to look too far ahead. But I do know what happens, but yeah. particularly to my own selfish reasons. But mm. I don't necessarily know Lena's story or, <laughs> you know, anybody else's in that respect to the, with the knowledge that I do mine. You know, so, but the scripts are always they're based on the novels. Is that because you want in each series to be only at the point of knowledge that Catelyn would be at? Yeah, I think so. And it's um, also you've got to... The scripts or your, your work sheets, it's your Bibles. It's actually exciting getting the yeah, scripts and not, not knowing. You're yeah. kind of like, <gasps> what? Yeah. But my mum reads the books and she's always highlighting passages and going, look at that. <laughs> <laughs> Does she? Yeah. yeah, she gets so excited. Oh, uh, wow. Sadist. <laughs> Especially when you have to be naked. Huh? All right. <laughs> <laughs> Another one of you and your brother. <laughs> <laughs> so when you got the pilot script, did you know? Did you know about the incest? Was that like this? Look, that's what drew me to you. That's what drew you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. No, I, I, I found out about the show from Peter <coughs> Dinklage. We were doing a little film in LA, and he was reading in the trailer, and he went. Arlene, this is great. There's a role for my sister. He was like, I'm getting a blowjob and she's fucking the other brother. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what he said. And I went, oh, it sounds interesting. <laughs> and that's how it came to, to sort of pass. It's true. <laughs> it's funny because when, when you start watching Game of Thrones, certainly my experience, and I know other people feel this way about it, you start off thinking it's a fairly simple story of a good family and a bad family. Um, and, you know, the, the good family have troubles and you think they're going to go through and solve it all. She's rejecting the good, bad, yeah. I hate But, but then there's so much, so much more to it than that. When did the penny drop? <laughs> oh, it's still dropping, I it's think. It's still dropping. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I mean, I, you, know, it's, you know, David and Dan, who write um, the scripts, are, you know, incredible. <clears throat> Amazing. And it's a real gift to receive them every season. And... The penny is always pretty obvious. Yeah. And like I say, the kind of constant change of all these characters, nobody's ever truly who you think they are. You can't really pin yeah. anybody down. I like this constant moving of everything. And which also, keeps once 
they see an actor inhabit a role as well and what they can do or what they can bring and the subtlety and the nuances, you know, they start to layer as well. Yeah. Um, and they can see that and they think, oh, that's interesting the way those two characters relate or, oh, what are they doing there? Let's try and work that. So they're constantly sort of like entertaining themselves as well with the characters, with the, with the material that's come from the novels from George's books. Because it just keeps changing yeah. and shifting and there's, there's always more to a character. Yeah. Mm -hmm. When did you realise that Game of Thrones was huge? Was there a moment when you just thought, wow, this is just, this is a massive show, that it, it's all happened? I think it's still, I mean, I, I'm always surprised anyway, do you know what I mean? But it's, um, it, no matter where you go now, people know about yeah. it. It's incredible. It's quite bonkers. Yeah. Do you get recognised in the street? Um, usually when I've got my clothes off, yes. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> no, yeah, you, you know. <laughs> um, yeah, you, you do, you do. I got actually. searched at Heathrow and the lady was halfway through and she went, is it you? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, you just wanted to look in my bag, I know it. <laughs> but you know, the weirdest of places. Mm. You could just smuggle anything in now. <laughs> she tries. I, I'm taking a koala home. <laughs> so, I mean... What? You're going to get stopped at customs. <laughs> I was joking. <laughs> Anyone from customs, I was joking. It's a merkin. <laughs> <laughs> Tourette. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, dear. When George comes on, it all makes sense. <laughs> Not the Merkin, just the, the conversation. I'm very happy for you to just to keep talking. It's incredibly entertaining. <laughs> <laughs> what's, um, what's been a really hard day on the set? And I, I guess for you, there's a one scene that comes to mind. A hard day on the set. Um, that jolly wedding. Oh, that was wonderful. <laughs> That was a lovely <laughs> wedding. I particularly liked the bride. Um, I thought her dress was lovely. Oh, was that Kate's yes. nose? Uh, when, when did you first find out about the, about the red wedding? I mean, that's, I remember reading it in the book and just going, he what? Uh, seriously? Um, I read the scripts and went, what? No, that's not true. Um, I knew. Um, it's something that anybody who has read the books talks about, actually. And a lot of the cast members who had read the books that far in advance. He used to talk about it a lot, and I kept hearing this red wedding, red wedding, what? And I was like, what is the red wedding? And um, <clears throat> so I sneakily went into a bookshop and stood and read the book. <laughs> stood and read the passage. And that's exactly what I did. And, um, and I was like, okay. And, um, but David and Dan always said in interviews that um, they kept referring to it as the RW. And somebody asked them once, um, when do you think you will know that you've, um, that Game of Thrones will be like a success or you'll have accomplished something? Mm -hmm. And they kept thinking, they thought, when we reach RW. And nobody really knew what it meant. And it was the Red Wedding. And that was the one thing that they yeah. wanted to put on the screen. They were so excited and thrilled. And <laughs> no, I mean, it's glorious. I do. Indeed. It it's was amazing. brilliant to do, actually. I was sitting with is. someone last night who hadn't seen The Red Wedding before and had been mm -hmm. sort of binge-watching all of the episodes to try and get up to tonight, yeah. and it, it did a head in. But uh, <laughs> it was great to just see, see that being, being rediscovered. And it was an amazing moment, wasn't it? I mean, when that went out on, on TV here and in the US, we get it on the same day now, mm -hmm. the entire world just stopped and went, what the fuck was that? <laughs> <laughs> what was that day like for you, Michelle? I was working in Toronto, so um, I think they get it. Is it the, on the Monday night? I don't think. I think Toronto screens it the day after in, yeah. a, in the States. So, and I was filming on the Monday, and, and I wasn't on on the Tuesday, but I was back on again on the Wednesday. And um, when I came in on the Wednesday, it was just like people going, oh, 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 you know, and I, you know, because once you've done it, 
you've done it. You know, you've achieved, you've worked. And um, how, how long was it between the filming and the, the broadcasting? It's of six those months, things? isn't it? Yeah. Six months usually, isn't it? Pretty yeah. Much. We've usually finished around end of November, and then March. it starts screening in March. Yeah. And how long before the airing did you get to watch it? I didn't see it actually until um, oh gosh, I've seen it once actually, and I watched like that. Uh, we don't have the clip uh, here, it's okay. Oh, damn. <laughs> um, I saw it, I had to, they do commentaries, what are they called, um, Lena? The things where you sit in a cinema and watch it and you comment. Commentaries. Commentaries, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and <laughs> I think it's a commentary. It's a commentary. <laughs> and um, I had to do David Nutter, who's a brilliant director, and he directed that episode. David Nutter was in LA, Richard Madden, who played Rob Stark, was in London, and I was in Toronto. So the three of us were all linked up, and we watched it in our separate cities and talked sequentially. And that was the first time I saw it, actually. And I was like, I couldn't watch, actually. I couldn't watch. It was, I remember reading yeah. it and thinking, A, I'm going to lose me pal. Oh. Aww. <laughs> It's not fun drinking alone. It's not. It's sort of your fault. It fair. is her fault. Ah. <laughs> 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 uh, but you know, obviously, I read it and I was like, I couldn't wait to see what Michelle Fairley, the genius, would do okay. with it. And uh, of course, I found it. We sat with about. 20 mates Did and watched it on a big screen. Did you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And I rung Richard straight after because I was like, oh, I can't put... I was in pieces. It was Aww. so beautiful. Aww. I'm a bit of a nerd about the show. Uh, and so, amazing, amazing job. Oh, well, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> oh. It must have been an amazing day on the set. Even, even the clean-up job would have just been <laughs> a massive... I don't know what... Yeah. Overtime for the, for the moppers, uh, I imagine. Actually, we finished quite early that day. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was the final thing that was shot. It was all shot sequentially from the arrival at the Twins and the whole way through. It was all done in order. And, um, and we had a real fun week, actually. It was great crack. And... Um, <laughs> And it was the final shoot was the the slice the slicing. And sorry, um, does anyone not know what the oh, red sorry. wedding is? Applaud applaud oh. now if you don't know what this is. Oh. It's this red <laughs> You do know. It's a really nice scene. Um in, in Westeros, red <laughs> is a traditional wedding garb. Yeah. Um, <laughs> very charming. Any idols there? It's brilliant. Yeah, it's <laughs> yeah. Lovely. Just Bad bring your own too. knife, you know. <laughs> And how did you feel at the, at the end of the day? Were you just absolutely gutted or did you just sort of walk off and just go, okay, let's have a drink? <laughs> um, I, didn't, I went and had a haircut, actually. Um, Ke the wonderful Kevin Alexander, who's the um, hair guy. Um, bless him, Kevin. Um, it was lovely because all the crew came on and it was, they'd achieved an amazing thing. Amazing crew. The camera, the sound, costume, makeup, hair, ward, everybody, you know, props. Those guys had worked so hard all week and everybody was amazing. And for them to achieve it as mm -hmm. well as actors and directors and the writers, it was, it was a wonderful sense of accomplishment. And, and I think everybody was proud of what they'd achieved, yeah. that they'd actually got there and done it and completed it. We, we and are surrounded by amazing, oh, amazing crew yeah. who work unbelievable mm. hours and, and do such lovely people too. incredible work. You're obviously all, all very good mates, or at least you, if you're not, you're really faking it brilliantly. They were I good actors, it. huh? <laughs> <laughs> I love her. <laughs> <laughs> See how good she is? <laughs> this is an acting masterclass right here. I know. Um, <laughs> Lena, for you, what's been the moment in the series that was, I, I guess, had the biggest impact? I, I guess nothing in the series quite reaches the, the RW moment, but mm -hmm. what for you, you know, was just a really amazing moment? For Cersei. 
Uh, well, we just did the PW. Oh. <laughs> uh, which was, yeah. Ooh. Uh, I mean, it's all, you know, I, I just, I, like I said, I'm a nerd. I just love it. I love it. I love her. I love the writing. It's an incredible gift of a job. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's just kind of constantly thrilling for me. And who's, who's fun to work with? I mean, who, who no are the, one. The no one's fun to work with. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's a, there must be a bit of a dynamic between you, I guess, particularly and Peter, if you knew him before, and um, particularly given you have so Wait, many great scenes. Peter Dinklage. I'm <laughs> <laughs> uh, About yay, hi. Uh, <laughs> yes, he's pretty awesome and silly. Um, we just, we giggle a lot, you know what I mean? It's, I mean, look what we do for a living. I know. You have to be really clever. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Ask me anything. Um, no, it's, a, it's, you know, we, it's been four years now. It's kind of, sorry, nerves. I just talk rubbish. Um, <laughs> but we're kind of a big dysfunctional bunch yeah. of gypsies who are genuinely fond of each other and then kill each other. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> One of the interesting things about, about your characters is they're both mothers and that it really seems to be one of the huge, one of the driving factors. Some of us are good mothers. For both of them. <laughs> Some of us have less kids to look after. Some of us have husbands who loved us. There is, no, there is no reply. Come on, put him up. I fucked my brother. What can I tell you? <laughs> <laughs> Only one of them, though. <laughs> Two would be weird. I know. <laughs> oh, I know. Oh. oh, dear God. I got a shiver. Sorry. I can't really top that. No. <laughs> be put in prison if you came out on stage and talked about incest the way we do, wouldn't you? If it wasn't about any other show, you'd get arrested, wouldn't you? Yeah. For everything. <laughs> For everything. <laughs> I guess what I was trying to get to... <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. It's, it, it's just... I, I mean, there's been a lot of analysis of, um, a Game of, Thrones, of, of Game of Thrones and A Song of Ice and Fire in terms of the role of women, because it's quite different from other fantasy and I guess from, from other productions, the, the roles for women are richer and, and deeper. Um, and so I guess just because both the characters are mothers, I was just uh, wondering, where am I going with this question? I don't know. Um, <laughs> how this has affected your own thoughts about um, questions of, of family and the role of women. I mean, playing women who are in such a different position in society from your own. Well, they're women, full stop, no matter what time zone you place them in, do you know what I mean? And if they're mothers, they're mothers. Um, and it's the essence of George's writing. He creates these incredibly strong women who, they are the power, basically, I think. You know, they have to play an even cleverer game in order to stay alive or not. Um, so, uh, <laughs> but, uh, so that's the... You know, and even the children that they produce, like uh, Catelyn Stark's kids, you know, like Arya and Sansa, you know, they're two, you know, opposite ends of the spectrum, but actually, you know, they are sort of like genetically of the same mold and they just keep evolving, you know, the whole, the incredible strength and like the character of Brienne as well and, and Cersei, you know, these are incredibly intelligent women. Do you like Cersei, Lena? If you met her, Lena, would you like her? We'd be BFF. <laughs> <laughs> I do. I. I... <laughs> <laughs> I. I do. I love Sussie. I think she, you know, she's incredibly complex and uh, under a lot of pressure. She needs a good shrink. That's what she, she needs. does. <laughs> she needs some therapy. <laughs> um, 
And I, I just, I, you know, what I, I don't think you can have light without the dark yeah. in, in all of these characters. Do you know what I mean? Everyone has a uh, possibility to kind of step to either side of the spectrum. And what I love is they kind of zip around it all the time. You know what I mean? And I think she's somewhere in there is a light of morality somewhere. <laughs> she's going to find it. That's what I love. She's got, there's lots more books coming. It'll come at some point. <laughs> and how, how do you feel about Catelyn? Because I know that at some, there are some fans who have issues with Catelyn at, at some oh, point. Oh, do they? A little surprisingly. Really? <laughs> what are your issues? <laughs> we'll, find out, we'll find out during the Q&A, perhaps. But <laughs> Step I'm forward. joking. Well, I think you should. You should be able to go, oh, I don't know. You have to question. Do you know what I mean? The, the people are multi-layered and they do things for, you know, sometimes it's out of character, sometimes it's, you know, uh, the detriment as well. And, I mean, I remember a scene in season one where Lena and I had one of the few, unfortunately, and, um, and listening to this brilliant speech that Lena had to give about the loss of her, ch her first child, I think it was, and suddenly... The, the knowledge that Catelyn Stark has of Cersei Lannister changes, you know, because she's learned that this woman is not just this cold, vicious bitch, but actually she's, she's as a mother, you know, there's this, it's seeping in, this sort of loss, and it's a protection, it's another layer of armor against getting hurt again. Uh, so they're constantly... Um, I mean, she's, Catelyn's not an easy character. She's not a particularly nice woman. She, sometimes she's got a rod up her ass, and you know, and you want her to be a little bit more chilled, you know, but have a little bit more fun, have some Type sex. Uh, <laughs> but, um, yeah, <laughs> typecasting. It's, yes, it is. And... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> So bring your sex, come on. Uh, but, um, uh, yeah, so, you know, it's, it's challenging. You know, it's, much, it's, it's wonderful to play, actually, especially when they go against the grain. You know what I mean? Should she have let the King Slayer out? Mm, well, she, yeah, um, well, of course I'm going to say yes. Uh, no, she shouldn't. No. <laughs> she shouldn't. She should, and she should never have let Tyrion win that battle either, up in the um, Eyrie. <laughs> you know, so, um, no, she shouldn't. And I think she knows that inadvertently herself. And she's constantly questioning herself. And she's a very religious woman as well. You know, she, you know, she believes in the old, pe in the old religion. So um, she just needs to let loose a bit more, I think. You know, stop sticking to the right path and just... You know, listen that corset, but we don't wear corsets. You know. okay. well, we're going to get George R. R. Martin out here in a moment, but just before we do that. Sorry, who is George R. R. Martin? <laughs> It'll be a wonderful surprise. Um, Lena, I just before we, we move on to that, just one final question. I didn't has, do it, I didn't. Has this interview been easier or harder than going on Sesame Street? Ah, oh. oh, no. a bit harder. <laughs> no Muppets <laughs> I'm not doing a bad job of <laughs> Alright, look Without any further ado Let's welcome to the stage The Grand Master of Westeros Mr Westeros. George R.R. R. Martin Where's he? Is he coming from this side? Where's he coming from? He's not there, there he is Where? Wow. Welcome. Well, glad to be here. But, but there is one question. I don't actually sing opera, though. You got to know that. Trying to find a for you. There, there is one question that I've I've been waiting to ask all day. Um, I know a lot of fans want to ask it, and I'm probably going to preempt the Q and A later on. And uh, <laughs> that's that's nice. That's nice. Cersei wouldn't have done that, by the way. Um, 
<laughs> and, and before we get any further, can I just ask you, Hodor? Hodor. I, I thought so. I thought so. You know, we have a, we have an, a new book that's uh, come out, uh, the, the Wit and Wisdom of Tyrion Lannister, a little stocking stuff, a book uh, with some of Tyrion's best, uh, best lines from all of the books published to date, and, and my publisher has said, you know, if that's a, that's a success as a Christmas stocking stuffer book next year, we'll do the, the Wit and Wisdom of Hodor. Uh. <laughs> Possibly an even shorter book. <laughs> Christian Nairn, who plays uh, Hodor, an amazing guy, you know, we cast him and uh, he had memorized all his lines in a day. <laughs> <laughs> the entire season, he had, he had everything right down. I was going to ask something more general, but let's go with this. How did you arrive at the word Hodor as opposed to anything else? Well, you have to keep reading. Uh, Fair enough. I'm not going to tell you that. <laughs> when, I, when I first started watching... Um, Game of Thrones, I, I thought it was a conventional story, as I was saying before, the, the good Starks and the bad Lannisters, and it became so much more than that. And when did you first realise the, the scale and the complexity of the story that you were creating? Well, I, I knew right from the beginning that I wanted it to be large and complex. Um, that partly came because of the origins of the story. I mean, I had been working in television for, for 10 years, from the mid-80s through the, through the mid-90s, and uh, I was pretty successful in that field, but there was a sort of a common theme every time I turned in a script. It was, George, this is great, but it's, it's too big and it's too expensive. We can't possibly do this. It's five times our budget. Could you please, in the second draft, cut it down? And could you eliminate? You, you have 137 characters here. We, <laughs> we have the budget for six. <laughs> uh, and this huge battle that you have, uh, could it be a duel between the hero and the villain? <laughs> and, you know, I was, I was a professional writer, so I, I did these things. And I was, for a decade, I was cutting my script, scripts. I was doing these immense immense, expansive first drafts, and then going back and cutting and trimming and tightening. And after 10 years of that, um, although I did it, I can't say I ever really enjoyed it. I always, you know, kind of preferred my first drafts. So when I went back to prose, which was uh, the place I had started in, I said, well, to hell with that. I don't have to worry about budget anymore. I don't have to work with anything. I can write something as big as my imagination. I can, with absolutely no limit. I'll have all the characters I want. I'll have battles. I'll have direwolves. I'll have dragons. I'll have immense settings. I don't have to worry about how many matte paintings we can afford. We, I can afford all the matte paintings I want. I just described them in words. And of course, I also said, well, this is absolutely unfilmable, so I'll never have to worry about Hollywood uh, <laughs> coming along and, and trying to make this. So. Uh, and it, it's kind of worked out well because, uh, it, although they are filming it, it's uh, David Benioff and Dan Weiss who have the problems. I just uh, continue to write it uh, large and expansive. <laughs> that being said, even, even I in 1971 and, and 70, or 19, uh, 1990, 91 and, and 93 and 94 when I was first working on it, I knew it was large, but I had no idea how large it would become. I, initially, I thought I was writing a trilogy. Um, I do sometimes go back and, and even say myself, did it have to be quite this large? <laughs> I'm just did, you, did you really need seven kingdoms? You know, the, the five kingdoms of Westeros, that has a nice ring. It could have been five kingdoms. Uh, that would have been pretty complex, but uh, you know, once you once you throw the balls in the air, like any good juggler, you have to keep juggling them. Well, it's not just the seven kingdoms. Then you've got all the, all the free cities, and you keep going east. And yes, I, I'm just yes, there is that. <laughs> there was <is> that too. <laughs> <laughs> you, you keep adding characters, which is, which is wonderful for, for the reader and as a fan of the world. They just keep, it just keeps getting more and more complicated, and more and more subplots um, come through. And I'm just wondering, in, in a general sense, do you ever wonder if it's going to be possible to tie up all the, all the loose threads. Do the phrase need to have another family wedding? <laughs> I, 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 uh, I do wonder about that. I have, you know, 
night terrors, I think, about that. Um, it appears I still have two more books to go, and I have, I have a lot of things to, uh, to wrap up in those last two books. But I think I can do it, but we'll see when we, uh, when we actually get to the end uh, whether indeed I can uh, pull all of, these, uh, all of these things together. Sometimes these damn characters have a mind of their own, and uh, they refuse to do what I want them to do. But uh, um, we'll, we'll see. We'll know in, you know, another... Uh, decade, I don't know <laughs> how well I've wrapped it all up. I have to, uh, you know, no, I can't actually be that long because I have to stay ahead of the show. David and Dan are writing very fast and I'm writing very slowly, so it's mm. kind of a race. I still have a lead, but it's, it's getting smaller with every passing year, so. You could just, for book seven, this, this plague just comes through the kingdoms and <laughs> they're almost all gone. Um, but... In, in writing the novels, one of the really lovely things about it is that you have this sort of wag like ability to slip into the skins of the different point of view characters and take on their voice and, and adopt that. And how do you choose which characters are point of view characters and which, which characters um, never really uh, get that treatment? Well, it's, it's not an exact science by any means. Uh, you know, I, I have a, a large story that I'm telling. Essentially, it's a, it's a world war. Um, it began very small with uh, everybody, everybody except Danny is, is in Winterfell when it first begins, and it's a very tight focus. And then as the characters split apart, first into two groups, and then the two groups split into four groups, and etc., uh, each of the characters encounters more people and has a different uh, type of it. It's, it's like if you were trying to do World War II in a novel. You know, you, you can write a novel of World War II, but do you, do you just pick one average GI and, and uh, do Band of Brothers? You know, well, that, that only covers the European theater. Then you have to do the Pacific to cover the mm. Pacific theater. And then do you make Hitler a point of view character? Well, what about the Japanese? Do you make them? Do you go into the White House and do Franklin Delano Roosevelt and how he was seeing things? And what about... Douglas MacArthur and Eisenhower, you know, each of these has a viewpoint and to present something as huge as World War II, you either need an omniscient point of view structure where you're telling it from the point of view of God who, who knows all, which is a pretty outmoded literary technique. Nobody really does omniscient anymore and I'm not interested in reviving that. Or you have a mosaic of, of people who are seeing one small part of it and uh, through that mosaic, you get kind of the entire picture, and that's the path I, I chose to chose to take. Uh, sometimes I question my choices. I mean, I, I I think if I had it to do over again, I would have made Rob a point of view character right from the beginning. I, I think um, the fact that he wasn't a point of view character led some people to assume that the fate that he met was the fate awaiting him. And I hate to give people that kind of clue. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it, it, would have been, it, it would have been more, more shocking if Rob had been, had been a point of view character from mm. the beginning. Mm. But uh, of course, that was not the choice I made. So, uh, you know, you, you pay your money and take your chances. Lena and Michelle, have you got um, any questions about your characters or requests or suggestions? <laughs> I don't know how often you get to hang out with George. <laughs> Maybe this is you that you could actually. I just want to go back to something George said, which is some of your characters refuse to behave how you'd like them to. Does that mean <laughs> some of them won't die even if you want them to? <laughs> <One thing. clears throat> no one in particular. No one in, no one in particular. Uh, that, that's an interesting question. Uh, I, I can guarantee that in the books everybody will die on schedule. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> but I, 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 can't, uh, I can't speak for what will happen in the TV show. David and Dan have already made a few divergences from uh, the things that happened in, in my script, and I expect they will be making a few more in, uh, in the years to come, in the seasons to come. So it is possible that there would be some uh, divergences. We've, we've already actually had a number of uh, uh, deaths 
but it, it, it actually tends in the other direction. David and Dan are killing a number of people who are still alive in the books. Yeah. You know, uh, thus far mostly minor characters, but uh, you know, Mago, the, the Dothraki who Khal Drogo rips out his throat, he's still alive in the books. Uh, Danny's handmaids, Eri and Jiqui, they're still alive in the books. They're, they're doing fine. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, you know, it, it, these, these things happen. I think Dave and Dan, you know, when I broached them about this, they point out that uh, unlike my book characters, uh, the actors expect to be paid money to appear in the show. <laughs> We do and it therefore, in order to introduce a new character who I've introduced, they got to kill some of the old characters so they can reassign the salary and still keep the, <laughs> keep the show on budget. So, uh, you know, that's, that's the, uh, the difficult problem there. Yeah, so, Lena, talk to your agent. <laughs> <laughs> Michelle, did you have a, a, a question? Or? Yeah, I would love to ask George, um, do each, the, each character that you create, are you... Um, are you drawing from people you've met? Is, do, is it people you've met that inspire you to create these characters, or is it just your wonderful imagination? Well, some of them are at least partially based on people that I've met. Some of them are based on characters from history, you know, I, although the, the work is fantasy, mm -hmm. it's strongly grounded in actual medieval history. The, the Wars of the Roses being one of the major things, you know, the, the Yorks and the Lancasters yeah. instead of the Starks and the Lannisters. Um, but I like to mix and match. I like to, you know, move, move things around. Um, I think ultimately a lot of it is, uh, is drawn from myself uh, in, internally. I mean, not to get too existential here, but uh, ultimately all of us are kind of all alone in the universe and the only one we really ever know deeply is ourselves. So I think the writer to create a living character has to have a certain amount of empathy and has to, you know, reach inside themselves and, and try to examine how would, even for a character who's not like your, yourself, mm -hmm. I mean, I'm a baby boomer born in a, to a blue collar family, working class family in Bayo, New Jersey. Uh, and I have written characters who are baby boomers born to a blue collar family in Bayo, New Jersey, the kind of audio autobiographical kind of fiction that you do. But I never wanted to be limited to that. So obviously I've never been a dwarf or an exiled princess or an eight year old girl or anything like that. But. <laughs> But still, when I'm writing those characters, when I'm writing Arya or when I'm writing Tyrion, I, I am those characters. I'm, I'm trying to get inside their skin and, and see how the world would be like if you were in that position, knowing who they are. Um, and it's not always easy, but you know, I've always believed that uh, you get this question, well, how do you write women or how do you write uh, um, a, a dwarf when you're not a dwarf, how do you write that? And yes, there are certainly differences, and some of that can be resolved by research or talking to people. I mean, I had a, I had a correspondence uh, with a fan uh, when I was writing the, uh, the first and second books long ago, uh, who was a, a paraplegic, who was paralyzed from the waist, waist down, and he gave me a lot of valuable insight about how to write Bran and, and what it would be like, and that kind of information from other people you can never duplicate. Um, but at the same time, ultimately, I think the humanity, the common humanity that all these characters share is more important than whether they're men or women or tall men or short men or, or princesses or peasants. Uh, those things make a difference, certainly, but the all human beings, I think, in all cultures throughout history have loved their children and wanted success and love and a certain prosperity and wanted to eat and, you know, not be killed. And, you know, there are certain very basic things that motivate all people, and I try to keep that in mind when writing any character. Lena, can you see a lot of George in Cersei? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I did want to ask, George, if you uh, fall in love with all your characters, you know, or do you, uh, does that change as you go along? 
I, I, I fall in love with many of my characters, and I certainly uh, identify strongly with the, uh, with the viewpoint characters, the ones, you know, that, and there's only about a dozen of those, but the ones where I'm actually inside the skin looking, looking out through the world, through their eyes. Uh, I think in order to write them, I have to identify with them. I have to essentially become them. And uh, some of them are much nicer people than, uh, than others. But uh, when I'm writing someone like, uh, say, Theon, um, who is a controversial character who some people like but many people hate, I, I have to try to see the world through Theon's eyes and, and make sense of what he, what he does. Mm -hmm. I mean, I love fantasy. I've been reading fantasy my whole life. Tolkien had a profound influence on me. Um, but I'm also very cognizant of some of the flaws of fantasy, and, and one of the things that drives me crazy and so much of the bad fantasy out there is the externalized view of evil, where like evil comes from the Dark Lord, and the Dark Lord is sitting in his dark palace, and he has his dark minions who are, <laughs> they wear black, and they're very ugly. Um, so I've deliberately tried to play with that. I've, I've uh, you know, I created the Night's Watch, who, even though they're full of thieves and poachers and rapers and, you know, generally the scum of the earth, are heroic people, but they all wear black. And, you know, meanwhile, I have some other people who are really, really handsome and good-looking and fair, but in, uh, no, not naming any particular names, <laughs> but, <laughs> but are not necessarily the nicest people in the world. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We were talking before about the, the moral complexity of the world, and it's something I think you really come to grasp a little, a little way into the first book and I, I guess the first series, that your assumptions about these characters and whether they're good or evil uh, are actually challenged as you go on. Do you think any, any character can be entirely good uh, or evil, or do you think that there are always shades of grey? No, I think, I mean, grey characters have always interested me most, and I think the world is full of grey characters. I, I, I read history and, and I don't see any purely heroic characters. I don't see any purely evil characters. I mean, you can pick the most extreme examples and, you know, famously Hitler loved dogs. So he was very nice to his dogs, but, uh, and Hitler didn't think he was a villain. Hitler thought he was the hero of the piece. Stalin, Mao, they all, you know, the great mass murderers of history, Genghis Khan, they all thought they were the heroes in, in, in their mind's eye. And uh, conversely, you can read stories about all of the saints in Catholic history and, and uh, Mother Teresa and Gandhi, and you can find things about them that were flaws or questionable actions that they did at one point. Uh, we're all gray. I think we all have the capacity in us to do heroic things, to do amazing, brave, courageous things, and we all have, if, have it in us to do very selfish things, greedy things, uh, cowardly things. Uh, sometimes the same people do things on, on different, different days. Uh, you know, you behave heroically on Tuesday, and on Friday you do something scummy. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we, all, we all have that, I, and I think that's how you make a, a, a character who uh, really has some depth to him and comes alive. And I think actors prefer portraying yeah. gray characters yeah, as well, don't yes. you? Uh, rather so. than, you know, Mother Teresa or... or yeah, that's boring. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can't wait to find out the, the redeeming qualities of Ramsay Bolton. That's going to be... <laughs> It's going to be fascinating. Um, Ram bad, Ramsey has had a hard childhood. You know? He was, you know, he was a, a bastard and uh, kind of uh, not, not treated well by his father. Uh, so, you know. A, once again, psychologists needed in, in Westeros. Um, it is our Mr. Stay today. It's a day for thinking about the real wars that, that have fought, and I know a lot of people have been doing that today. One of the things that, that I really love about the world you've created is the way that war is portrayed um, in terms of its effects on the small folk. You, you don't forget the, the ordinary people in all the focus on the, the lords and ladies and the battles. And I know you've studied a, a lot of history. What have you, I guess, gained from your studies of real wars and, and brought into A Song of Ice and Fire? Well, you know, one of the things about fantasy, uh, 
from Tolkien and even before Tolkien, what writers like Robert E. Howard is, so much of it is concerned with war. You know, those, those swords are not just for show. There, there's a lot of battles and stuff being depicted in, in fantasy. And of course, the simplistic fantasy, the, it's always the fully, fully justified war. It's uh, the forces of light fighting that dark lord and his really ugly evil minions. Uh, and obviously you have to fight the ugly evil minions in the black because otherwise they would spread evil over the earth. Uh, but real history is more complex. Um, you know, I, I think I steal, uh, I steal from the best like Shakespeare. Um, you know, there's that, that great scene in, um, in Henry V where Hal in disguise is walking among his men on the night before the Battle of Agincourt and some of the men are saying, you know, I hope, I don't know, I'm not in a position to judge whether the king's cause is just or not, but if it's not just, he, he's going to have to answer for it for all the people who are going to die tomorrow who are fighting for his claim to the French throne. And uh, there, there's a long discussion between the characters and between Hal himself in disguise about that. And that's a valid question here. I mean, you look at the, uh, the Hundred Years' War, I mean, uh, people talk about it as if it was a war between the English and the French. It was really a family quarrel between the Capetians and the Plantagenets, and, and yet it lasted a hundred years, and entire generations were slaughtered, and countless people uh, villages burned, fields burned, people starved to death, women raped um, because these two families had a quarrel over who should, who should uh, receive the feudal homage of the underlords and the taxes. Uh, you know, you really have to examine some of these wars and I, I try to pre present that. Uh, I also try to show, people have talked about the violence of the, of the books and of course the violence of the TV series that results from that. Um, I think if you want to write something that's not about war and violence, that's great. I, I enjoy books like that. I've even written a few books and stories that have no violence in them, that have no murder or killing. But if you are going to write about war, if you are going to have murder and killing, then I think it behooves you to present it honestly, to present it in all its ugliness and horror because it was pretty, pretty horrible. I mean, the medieval battles were exceptionally bloody. We have descriptions of that. People going about and striking each other with, uh, with large, very sharp pieces of metal that hacked off limbs and left devastating and hideous injuries. And there were no mash units rushing in to try to, uh, to save the people. Uh, there, there are, at, at Battle of Hastings, there are descriptions from contemporaries of, of streams of blood, so much blood in the human body, and when you're hacking off limbs, a lot of it gets sh um, shed. Um, I think if you're gonna show a battle, then you, then you should show that. You shouldn't show like a clean battle where it's all just the banners streaming and the winds and the genius of the generals. Yes, that's part of it. Show that by all means, but also show the other side of it show the, the people grieving over the people that they've lost and uh, the after effects of it, uh, show the, the, the maimed men who lived afterwards. That's, if you're gonna write about war, write about war with a, a degree of honesty. Why did you decide uh, to get involved in, in adapting the work yourself rather than just simply handing it over and saying, you know, do, do what you wanna do? Well, you know, it's, it's my, my baby. Uh, I sent it off to school, but I don't want to abandon it entirely. I like the idea of uh, keeping, keeping my hand in. Actually, I would love to write more than one episode. I, there's some, some days that I, I regret that I'm not in Northern Ireland with David and Dan sitting in the writer's room and breaking down the season and writing you know, two or three episodes uh, a season. Um, but if you want the other two books, I can't. Uh, <laughs> I can't possibly do that. There's only uh, so many hours, uh, so many hours in the day. That that clip with uh, with Richard and uh, Michelle, um, you know, brings home to me one of the points we were we were talking about, which is uh, you know not only presenting death but presenting grief which is actually something harder to do in the context of, of television. Um, you know, years ago, um, this may surprise some of you out there, but I, I wrote before 
Game of Thrones. <laughs> I, did, I did other things, uh, both in prose and in television and film. And I was on a show called Beauty and the Beast. Uh, I don't know if it was, I, I guess it was shown here in Australia, but it was not. We get everything, we have no standards, don't we? Uh, <laughs> but it ran for three seasons on CBS in the late 80s. And uh, it starred Ron Perlman as the, the Beast, and a contemporary retelling of Beauty and the Beast. Ron Perlman was the Beast, Vincent, and Linda Hamilton played uh, uh, a character named Catherine Chandler. Um, who was the beauty, and Linda left the show after the second season. She uh, wasn't interested in doing any more television, she wanted to do features, and so she left the show, and then we had to decide, well, do we recast the character, do we recast one of our leads, or do we write the character out? And we decided to write the character out because it was more dramatic. And we would have her character killed, and then we would bring in a new character, so that was the decision we made in the writer's room. And then we had this huge fight with the network at the time. After we did the episode in which Linda's character, Kathleen Chandler, died, we did an episode in which her body was found and she was buried and it was essentially an entire 60-minute episode of people weeping and grieving and sharing their memories of Catherine, much as if, if you had lost a, a loved one. Um, We've all experienced that when we've lost uh, our parents or our siblings or our close friends. We've all experienced that kind of grief. It's a powerful human emotion. But the network didn't want us to show it. The network wanted it. They said, the character is dead. We got to move on. We got to introduce the new beauty, the new female lead. Let's never mention the name of her character again and just move right on with adventures and excitement and then people will find a new beauty and forget about the other beauty. And of course, we, the writers were horrified by this idea and said, uh, no, we can't do that. We spent two entire seasons saying, this is Romeo and Juliet, this is Tristan and Isolde, this is one of the great love stories of the ages. He's not immediately gonna forget about her and move on to the next beauty. And, we kind of won the battle, but we lost the war. We presented the episode. It was a very powerful episode. Um, I think our hardcore viewership watched that episode and wept copious tears, and then they didn't tune in the show ever again, and our ratings yeah. just fell off a, a cliff <laughs> because, you know, grief doesn't necessarily have high entertainment value, but I think if you're doing art, it is important, and, and a scene like the one that you played there, where not only is someone killed, and not only is there talk of revenge, but there's grief. There's, you see the effect that murders and, and wars have on actual human beings and the way we have to deal with it afterwards. That makes for more powerful storytelling. But you always have to accept, if you do that, that there will be a portion of the audience who will, will not like that, who, who will say, that's not why I watch television, so I can cry. Uh, yeah, I, th I think the people who watch Game of Thrones and don't like death tune out pretty quickly. <laughs> and Lena and Michelle, you get plenty of, um, plenty of opportunities <laughs> for grief during the course of the series. I mean, there's a lot of compression that has to happen. There are changes that happen. How do you, how do you feel about that, particularly working as a writer? Do you ever sort of say, hang on a sec, I'm George R. R. Martin, this is not the way it's supposed to be, or are you contractually bound to go along with what they want to do? <laughs> I'm not contractually bound, but you know, years ago uh, when David and Dan and I had our, our first meeting that would lead to uh, us teaming up to pitch this to HBO, um, you know, we discussed the whole general issue of, uh, of, of faithfulness and adaptation. And uh, we, we didn't know each other. It was sort of a get to know your meeting and exchanging ideas. And I think both of us said something that reassured the others. Uh, you know, David and Dan said, we want to, we love your story and we want to bring your story to a different audience. We want to adapt your story and be faithful to it. And that was definitely what I wanted to hear. What I said that I think they wanted to hear is, look, I've worked on the other side of this. I've worked for 10 years in television and film. I know that you can't be completely faithful. I know that some changes are inevitable. You have, you have a budget. You have only a limited number of hours. It's not going to be a sentence-by-sentence, scene-by-scene, 
transcription of it, which I, I think some prose writers don't understand. Prose writers who haven't worked on the other side of it tend to get very upset when a, a movie or a television show is made of their work and, and there is a change, they, they freak out and some of them who are rich enough take out ads in Variety denouncing people or give <laughs> negative interviews and I think David and Dan wanted to be sure I wasn't crazy like that. Uh, and hopefully I, I did reassure them. Now, um, nothing is ever perfect, either human beings and great characters or, or an adaptation or indeed although it's hard for me to admit, a novel. There may be imperfections in even my work. Sad to, <laughs> sad to think. Um, you know, we have, we have 10 hours a season, 10 episodes of one hour each. I wish we had more. I wish we had uh, 12 hours or 13 hours, as other HBO shows do. There's one person who agrees. I'm sure we all agree. <laughs> we, have a, we have a large budget. We have one of the largest budgets of any television show being made right now but I wish we had a larger budget. <laughs> you can always use more money for actors and battles and special effects. And, you know, we have things like the dragons that are gonna get more and more expensive every season. Um, <laughs> but given the fact that we do have a limited budget and we do have a, a limited amount of running time, David and Dan have faced difficulties of, of having to uh, combine characters, eliminate characters, eliminate scenes etc. And sometimes to bridge these or because they're interested, they write new scenes. Uh, some of those have been terrific scenes. Uh, you know, I mean, that, that uh, speech that Michelle gave was very moving and I know um, there's a first season scene between uh, Cersei and Robert where they discuss their marriage. Great scene. Yeah. Uh, not a word of it from the books. It's, uh, <laughs> because uh, Cersei becomes a viewpoint character, but she's not a viewpoint character in the first book. So we can never see a private moment between her and Robert because we don't have a viewpoint character into it with the structure I use. Um, second season, that episode, uh, the Blackwater episode, which is you know, pretty closely adapted from the book and is mostly my work, but there is a scene at the beginning where Bronn and the Hound almost get into it in a, in a brothel. Uh, terrific scene, not a word of it from the book, you know, neither Brown nor the Hound is a viewpoint character, but it really added a lot to, uh, to the things. So, you know, you have to take each, each case uh, on its own things. And I don't necessarily agree with every decision Dan and David made, but, you know, we, it's the way a writer's room works in Hollywood, and I w wish I was there in the writer's room more, but as I said, I can't be. But uh, we still have these discussions, just as I did on shows like Beauty and the Beast, where we argue about what should happen next, and it could be this way, it could be that way, maybe we have that thing. It's the collaborative nature of, uh, of television making. I don't have to do that in my books. I have no collaborators, it's all me. Uh, so love it or hate it, you can, uh, you can blame me for what's in the books. We're gonna take some questions in a moment. Before we do the final question, I wanted to ask each of you, is really about the whole of the world that, that George has created and the TV show has created, the, the world of, of ice and fire, um, which, do you think it's a pessimistic world where it, you get caught up in struggles and you can't overcome them? Is winter coming? Um, or <laughs> is there actually hope? How do you feel about it at this point, I guess, in the series, this point in the work, Michelle? Well, I think the, simply because the characters are so multidimensional, so incredibly um, written, these are people that want to survive. Nobody's going out there to, to want to die today. You know, so they're, they're, they have a passion for life and survival. And I think anybody who lives in that world has to have a tough skin. And it's watching, watching these people develop their tough skins as well. That's how you play the game in order to survive. It's like Cersei's wonderful line to, to Ned, you know, play the game, you know. What do, what do you think, Lena? Um, well, I think, it, I think, you know, it sort of sits somewhere in between, you know, fantasy and kind of brutal reality, as George said, you know, the kind of mm. reflection of war that's in it all the way through. Um, I don't think it's entirely pessimistic. I think it's littered with brilliant humor. You know what I mean? Yeah. There are moments of pure joy in it that we kind of forget sometimes. Uh, but I wouldn't argue that winter is coming. Uh, 
I don't know, winter is coming. Uh, <laughs> I mean, in, in, a, in a very basic level, winter is coming for all of us. Uh, uh, I think that's one of the things that art, not just my art, but uh, all of literature and, and even the visual arts is concerned with is the awareness of our own mentality. Valar Magulis, uh, you know, all, all men must die. Um, and that shadow lies over our world and, and will until medical science gives us all immortality, hopefully with eternal youth. I don't want immortality without eternal youth. Uh, <laughs> and the, but I don't necessarily think that makes it a pessimistic world or, or perhaps not any more pessimistic than the real world that we live in. I mean, we're, we're here for a short time and we should be conscious of our own mortality, but the important thing is that you know, love and, and compassion and empathy with other human beings is still, is still possible. Laughter is still possible, even laughter in the face of death. Um, the struggle to make the world a better place. You know, we, we have things like war and murder and rape and horrible things that still exist in the world. Um, but we don't have to accept them. We can, we can fight the good fight, I think, the fight to uh, eliminate those things. So there is darkness in the world, but uh, um, I don't think it, we necessarily need to give way to despair. I mean, one of the great things that Tolkien says in Lord of the Rings is, you know, despair is the ultimate crime. That's, that's the, the ultimate failing of Denethor, the steward of Gondor, is that he despairs of ever being able to defeat Sauron. Um, we should not despair. We should, you know, do not go gentle into that good night. So winter is coming, but light, light the torches and drink the wine and gather around the fire. We can still defy it. And a lot. A lot of characters, George, are very optimistic about their chances of sitting on that Iron Throne. They can't <laughs> all be right. Let's have some questions just before we start. Um, just a few rules. I can cut you off at any point by doing <laughs> this if it turns into a, an extended um, ramble, to be frank. Uh, if, you, if you ask when the next book is coming out, you'll be sent directly to the wall <laughs> and locked in an ice cell. If you want to run your theory about who Jon Snow's mother is or how the prophecy is fulfilled, <laughs> These people are intelligent, they're not going to fall for that and give it all away. So let's, uh, without any further ado, microphone one. G'day, George. Um, just in, in regards to your Duncan Egg novellas, uh, just quickly, is the fiddler gay? And do you intend on writing up to and maybe even including Summerhall in the events there? Uh, yes, the fiddler is gay. Um, and if I eventually get to Summerhall, then Summerhall will be included. It's one of the key events, but that's like six novellas further on, so I don't know how many years that, that will, uh, will extend. I do have uh, the, the first of the Duncan Egg uh, collections that I've planned will be coming out next year or possibly the year after. It'll be called The Night of the Seven Kingdoms. It'll have the first three novellas in it, The Hedge Knight, The Sworn Sword, and The Mystery Knight. And we've made arrangements, which I'm very excited about, to have the book copiously illustrated by Gary Gianni, amazing, amazing artist who uh, recently did the uh, 2014 Ice and Fire calendar. So uh, he's going to be doing practically a, a picture for every page. It's going to be a real throwback to the old uh, illustrated books of yore. But I still have a whole bunch of other Duncan Egg stories to write. I forgot to, uh, to add another rule, which is that we're going to do questions in turn. Uh, for, for Lena and Michelle as well. So is there a question for Lena at one of the microphones? A microphone to the, the woman there. Can you ask your question to Lena? Hi, it's actually for both the ladies, if that's okay. Sure. Um, if you could play any other character, regardless of age or gender, who would it be and why? Hodor. <laughs> <laughs> And you've already memorized all those lines. <laughs> yes. <laughs> She's got it mastered. <laughs> um, well, I mean, apart from... I mean, I think the one I love watching, apart from Lena, obviously, 
It's Tyrion, actually. Mm -hmm. Possibly anyone who's still alive. Yeah. Um, <laughs> all right. Have anyone we got a, with a heartbeat? Um, microphone three. Have we got a question for, for Lena and or Michelle? Um, sort of all three. Uh, for George, which character was the most interesting or challenging to write out of Cersei and Catelyn, and who would win in a fight between the two? <laughs> <laughs> Shall we try? <laughs> you know, answering questions like that gets you in a lot of trouble. The, I think the Trojan War started with a question mm. like that. Uh, choosing between three strong women, and uh, there's no, uh, there's no. He's not going to destroy the answer. cannon, okay? Yeah. Um, I don't know who would win in a fight. Mm. Uh, think about it carefully. Uh, Danny could probably take both of them because she has. <laughs> Has dragons. <laughs> <laughs> Microphone four. Uh, my oh. question's for George. Uh, you said that you had an issue with uh, the great evil living in his black tower with all that sort of stuff. But you've presented the others and all the White Walkers as kind of like this overbearing evil. So I was wondering if there was more depth to that, if they were probably not as evil as they're being conceived? Well, I do have two more books to write, so <laughs> there's, there's still a lot that you uh, don't know about the nature of the others and the White Walkers. So, They've got uh, such pretty eyes, too. <laughs> uh, <laughs> microphone one. We've got a question for uh, Lena or Michelle. Anyone? No. <laughs> I'll go on, then. Mine's a bit complex, uh, I'll try to boil it down. Um, I'm doing my doctoral thesis on, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> on religion and spirituality in contemporary literature, and I find it so fascinating how you handle religion and spirituality. Um, and I'm just wondering, um, in particular, where your inspirations came from for the various different religions. Um, and perhaps if you're trying to make a comment or why you chose to approach it the way you did. Those are some very, very broad questions. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, I, that's, that's your doctoral thesis right there. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, it's interesting. I was discussing this th this morning with an, uh, an interview I was doing with a journalist uh, who asked me some questions about religion. J.R. Tolkien, um, was a profoundly devout and religious Catholic, and yet he left religion out of Lord of the Rings entirely. There's no temples, there's no priesthood, there's, there's nothing, but there is the actual physical presence of, of gods or godlike beings. I mean, the, uh, the Sauron and, and his predecessor Morgoth are essentially fallen angels, and um, so, so there's a deeply religious underpinning. I was raised Catholic as well, but I'm not a practicing Catholic. I suppose I'm an agnostic or an atheist at this point in time. But you, in, in writing about the Middle Ages, you have to take into account the immense power of the church during the Middle Ages. And if you're going to have a quasi-medieval thing, I think it behooves you to include something similar to that. So in, in my case, the medieval Catholic Church was one of the inspirations for the faith of the seven, which is the dominant religion of the uh, of the seven kingdoms. Um, you know, I, as a Catholic, I was raised with the whole doctrine of the Trinity. You know, which, uh, like many kids, I thought, okay, there are three gods. Oh no, no, the nuns would say there are not three gods. There's only one god with three aspects. Okay, right. <laughs> And the aspects each have a name, right? And one aspect is the son of the other aspect. I, <laughs> I was confused by all that. But I picked up on it and echoed that confusion with the seven. Uh, you know, the maiden mother crone thing was, uh, is a traditional pagan belief system, uh, which I uh, drew on a lot from my, my wife, Paris, who's, who's here. Uh, the, and then I invented the male equivalent to that with the... Uh, with the father, warrior, and smith, and then I added the stranger as a as a the odd odd one out the the wild card, so to speak. Um, a lot of the uh, 
Melisandre's religion, the, uh, the religion of the uh, Lord of Light, is drawn from uh, some of the dualistic religions in history, Zoroasterism on one hand and the Albigensian heresy of the Cathars on the other hand, who really did believe that, uh, you know, again, this is a, a weird echo of medieval Christianity and Catholicism where we, we, we talk about a battle between God and the devil, but, but the devil is always inferior to God. The devil is actually doomed to lose because he, he's a, a lesser, he's lesser than God. He's, he's not, he was created by God just like everything else. Uh, the Albigensians and the Cathars believed that it was much more of a war. There was a good God and an evil God, and they were at eternal war with each other, and we really didn't know which one was going to win. Um, and they also had the interesting Philip is that the, the world that we live in was created by the evil God. That's why things are so screwed up and we have things like pain and suffering and, uh, you know, I was never satisfied with that explanation by the nuns either, you know. Why, if God is so wonderful and loving, why do we have pain? Well, pain is to tell us when we're ill or our body is breaking down, you know, and it's like, couldn't we have had like a, a light, uh, like a dashboard light that, <laughs> oh, my appendix is going out. Did we ever really have to have excruciating pain? Is that uh, uh, a good thing for the loving God to do this? Oh, I don't know. I'm digressing here. But yeah, yeah, I drew on many sources. I, you know, there's the famous uh, saying of all writers, if you steal from one person, it's plagiarism. If you steal from a hundred people, it's research. So I, I do a lot of research into history and Shakespeare and all these good things. Make sure you uh, footnote that appropriately, please. Um, microphone number two, is there a question for our actresses? Yes, there is. Um, a question for Lena and Michelle. Um, Lena, you're saying you were auditioning for the part of Catelyn. Uh, if you were to get the part, how would you have played it differently than Michelle's portrayal. And Michelle, a uh, question for you, how do you think she would have done? <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh, <laughs> what a That's question. That's a fucked up question. <laughs> <laughs> um, You can, just, you can just say, you can just say, I'll take that as a comment and move on. We do it all the time on this show called Q&A. I'll take that as a comment. Right, I just, she's gotta... amazing. I don't, you know, obviously I'd have been better. Oh, no. <laughs> uh, no, it's incredible. Microphone, yeah. microphone yeah. three, maybe an, a, a, another question for the actresses. She'd have done wonderfully. Uh, no, my question's for George. Right. <laughs> I've written a book. Uh, George, <laughs> we talked oh, yeah. about women earlier, but... Um, did you set out to choose voices of people who hadn't been heard in fiction, the cripples, the imps, those sorts of voices? Did you choose those specifically and what drew you to those kind of... Cripples and uh, bastards and, and broken things, yes. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's, you know, ma many of my viewpoint characters have something that makes them ill-suited to the society or the family or the station in life that they have been dealt. Um, and sometimes there's something very obvious about Tyrion being a dwarf, uh, Jon Snow being a bastard, uh, Bran being, you know, broken and paralyzed. Um, in other cases, it's, I don't know, more, more subtle, uh, you know, Davos, who is low-born, and he has risen high, but he, he can never quite overcome the, the taint of the fact that he was basically a peasant and, and uh, in a class-oriented system, that's a big thing. And the women in, in medieval society, or indeed in the society of Westeros, uh, certainly a, a woman born to House Tully or House Lannister had a lot of privileges, had, had great wealth and power in a certain way, but it was a different sort of power it, it was power that they had to exercise through the men around them. Even their very inheritance could be threatened if there was a male claimant uh, who, uh, you know, would take it away and there was a lot of stuff. And this is from the real Middle Ages, of course. Uh, you know, could a woman inherit? Could a woman be a crown? There are, there are things in English history and all, all of that. So 
the women in a medieval society can exercise power, but they're exercising it through their husbands, they're exercising it through their sons, and that can be a very frustrating thing to do. And, and, and I think in particular with Cersei, I really <clears throat> tried to talk about that. I mean, Cersei and Jaime are twins and are look so much alike as children that they would play with gender switching and even trade clothes and things like that. But at a certain point, suddenly the interchangeability vanished and they were put on very different things. And Cersei has a, a speech about that in the Black War episode where he was given a sword and was taught to fight and I was taught to smile and sing songs. And uh, that changes a person. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that is the end of our event. Winter has come, we are out of time. Uh, we could talk for hours, I'm sure there are many more questions, but we'll have to wait until the next series. Who knows? We'd love to do it again, of course, sometime. Um, what will happen now is a signing. Can I just remind you all, pl uh, only line up once, one item per person, only books or items of official, official merchandising. And please don't forget, every book uh, that is signed means 30 seconds less time uh, that George is spending working on the next book. So <laughs> be very careful. Please thank our guests. George R.R. Martin, Lena Headey and Michelle Fairley.